So, Assalamu alaikum everyone, uh, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the day so far and the tea break. Uh, so now we're moving on to the last part of the event for the day. And uh, this is the inaugural uh, lecture. It's going to be given as an annual forum by Said Babarali. So you're the inaugural uh, individual and we're going to carry on this tradition every year after this. I wanted to just again uh, thank you all for coming here. This is uh, London School of Economics and LUM's collaboration. Uh, we're very, very fortunate and, and, and truly uh, um, very thankful to LUM's for mounting this conference uh, and for Babarelli Saib through his foundation for giving us the finances to enable this. Uh, of course, um, uh, Babarelli Saib's involvement with LUMS uh, is right from the outset. And uh, in a way, uh, uh, sometimes I've been asked the question, if I could spend an hour with somebody, who would that be? And immediately, uh, Baba Ali Saib comes to mind. He's the person that I want to spend about an hour with and ask him almost any questions under the sun, which is what I'm going to be doing today. So here we are, and my wish has come true. So, Said Babarelli is, is a founder of LUMS, Lahore University of Management Sciences. He's a businessman, he's a philanthropist, he's an educationist. Uh, he, was ordered, he, was, he was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 1997 by our um, uh, previous Queen, Queen Elizabeth II. He has served as the president of the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, he also has been awarded an honorary doctorate from McGill University, so really I should be referring to you as Dr. Uh, Baba Ali Saib. Uh, he's uh, the second Pakistani to be inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> and perhaps he will talk about that a little bit. So I have a series of questions and I've been asked by Barbara Lissad not to let him know anything about what I'm going to ask him. Uh, I wanted a meeting to tell him what I was going to ask him, but he didn't say, say yes, go ahead. He just gave me a meeting and we had coffee, but he didn't want to hear these questions. So these questions are really fresh. And my first question is, at business schools, what we're used to teaching is that organizations have many problems. And 20% of the reasons for those problems is what you need to focus on to get rid of 80% of those problems. In Pakistan, there are many challenges, and we've heard many of those today, from water to sanitation, to hygiene, to gender balance, to corruption, to lack of transparency, to uh, uh, foreign debt, to a wide variety of other issues tied to politics and health and education and so on. So if we were to focus on one-fifth of those to tackle a majority of the problems, what would you say those should be? Um, well, you can't tackle every problem. Um, but I, what I would do is I'd take people who would be specialists at doing whatever they're good at and empower them, give them the authority to go ahead and give them the support to, to deliver and, and, and give them a task that is doable, not something that is uh, out, of the, uh, you know, out of their reach. And, um, you know, there's an old Persian saying that katra katra mishavadarya, but every drop will ultimately become an ocean. So you can't solve all the problems in one go, but try and look at a problem that is doable, solve it, move to the next problem. And uh, it, you don't have to look at only one problem, but, you know, a spectrum of different issues and select people to do it because there's no shortage of talent here. You, what you need to do is to select people on basis of merit and give them the, 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 the authority, give them the resources, and, um, and, um, and, and give them the, the, the ability to, to, to deliver and also you know, make sure that they hire people who are also on merit. There is no shortage of good talent in this country provided you look for it. Right, right. No, I, that is completely agreeable. We we provide people with the resources and we yeah, give yeah. them the I autonomy. Mean, is, uh, you've seen, sure. uh, uh, you know, people that came out of your institute over the last 35 years, they've gone and 
made their mark, not only here, but in the most competitive environment around the world. Right. Yeah. And um, so what you need to give, you, you need to give good, uh, you know, good basic training. You, you've got to put premium on integrity and honesty. Uh, that is very important. Sure. And, um, and that is something that um, I've seen it in the, in the business world, in the, in the world industry that uh, I've been involved with. Uh, I've seen it here at, at LUMS. I mean, if you select um, faculty, you select students on merit. I don't know, in the last 35 years, we've admitted even one student who was not, uh, you know, didn't qual qualify to get in. So it can be done provided you have that, um, that uh, discipline. And uh, you not only talk about it, you have to you practice it, demonstrate it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very, very good response, I think. In a sense, though, LUMS is, is a private institution, although it's not for profit. And you could suggest that perhaps it is part of what we referred to in the earlier conversation as part of civil society. Um, you've, you've, of course, not just founded LUMS, but in a sense, very many other organizations that could be sort of considered in the civil service sector. Um, I wonder, as a major philanthropist, whether there's a risk that you go too far and then you alleviate the burden of responsibility on the state to provide those services because you create a civil society that is largely funded through philanthropists. So is there a risk that you go too far in gift giving and you basically relieve the state from shouldering the burdens that it should be and that people expect it to? Well, I mean, giving is something that you don't talk about. You just do it. And, um, and it's something that, um, uh, you know, I believe that the money doesn't belong to you that comes to you. Somebody has given it to you to give it away. But make sure that you, you give it in a manner that it can be put to good use. There's no waste in it. Sure. Because it's somebody's hard work that has earned that money, yeah. so so I, and 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 I, you see people who uh, do. I mean, the poor man is much more uh, giving than the rich man is. Uh, they are willing to share half their bread with somebody else. That is philanthropy. That is giving. So it's it's something that uh, there is no shortage of giving in this country, but. What you need to do is to encourage it and organize it in a manner that it's put to good use. And it's happening. And, uh, and I find that nobody gets poor by giving. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, so no one gets poor by, by giving. Um, I wonder then if you think that Pakistan, of course, has many very bright individuals. Uh, there are the resources, uh, there's the willingness to do things. But then, according to today's earlier talks, and generally indices would suggest that Pakistan trails behind other countries in so many ways. So what is it that is missing if, if the, um, you know, the manpower is there, in a sense, the intelligence is there, the wherewithal is there, uh, the willingness to do things is there, but things are not moving fast enough. What are the major well, I, hurdles? I think the basic, um Weakness in our whole system is we're not investing enough in education. And education doesn't mean higher education. It means education at the primary level, secondary level, tertiary level. And um, education doesn't mean just pe making people literate. And you've got to sort of mentor them to tell them what is right and what is wrong. And that, I think, is actually equally important than to make people literate, is to... Um, give them the sense of um, value. Uh, and this is something that I've uh, been talking to you and to your colleagues that, um, you know, I mean, what uh, um, Dr. Chuktai was talking about cheating. I mean, uh, here I've, I've been sort of encouraging uh, faculty to, um, uh, to, to introduce honor system so that you know, you don't invigilate examinations. Let the people, you know exactly who's cheating and who's not cheating. And the people who cheat will 
themselves find be found out and uh, uh, you've got to sort of trust people you've got to sort of encourage them that there's a premium on being honest uh, and uh, it, it this is a part of your responsibility as as a teacher whether you're a dean or a or or a, or a professor you've got to i mean my sort of um, um advice i i don't have to advise advice you know faculty members they are much more uh, you know competent than i am but my certainly my two words to them is that the uh, uh, the real objective of good teacher is that his student has to be better than him uh, and uh, so uh, and 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 not only in ability but in integrity and you've got to instill that it's it's an ongoing crusade just as you rear uh, children i mean i was very lucky the teachers that i had gave me as much love and as much uh, attention as they did to their own children and that's why i've uh, till the day they passed away i respected them i treated them as my own parents because they were the ones who uh, honed your uh, character your your ability to to um, to address issues to solve problems and um, so these are um, it's an ongoing uh, kind of an effort and uh, there is no better place than education institution and um, i'm time and again i've been talking to us your students here and they asked me what is your ambition of a of a lamp student i said uh, a lamp student will never tell a lie that to me is is, is the greatest uh, uh, qualification of a good 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 learning uh two weeks ago i had the po- uh, uh, possibility of meeting some of your alumni in the silicon valley and uh, i talked to them and uh, this is something that i kept on stressing on them that it, it you know it's it's very heartening to see that uh, uh, an nop scholar coming from lahore or from a village ending up in the silicon valley and doing well he came up to me and he whispered in my ears he said i bought my father a house back home for the first time I, I, my family owns a house i mean that to me was uh, was very rewarding to hear that uh, here was a boy who went to america earned enough money to send money home so that his family could have a roof over, the, over their head for the first time yes. so this is um, an education is something that a key that opens any lock in this world mm-hmm. and uh, education doesn't mean a degree it means your ability to solve problems to 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 work hard to work sincerely to work honestly to serve whoever you are working for in in a very uh, a manner of of uh, with integrity and and devotion uh, right yeah that's a good wide definition of education certainly so a, a large number of students leave this institution lums which is probably considered as as the best institution of higher education in pakistan the, does that in a sense trouble you that individuals who would come to lums basically end up being offered jobs abroad and then they end up in places like silicon valley and elsewhere rather than seeing pakistan as a first call in terms of providing giving back to the country is is that is that something well i mean you, you know of the 18000 students that have graduated from here about i would say about 5000 are, are abroad right. and but the other 13 14000 that are here in the country very few people are sitting at home and wasted their education i would say that 95 or 99% of them are gainfully employed working either for themselves or for somebody else and have by and large done very well very well sure. both boys and girls right. right so i mean that to my mind is a small contribution that uh, you as a dean and the, your colleagues uh, who are on the faculty here have um, uh, have worked hard to to educate these uh, not only educate but but to 
to mentor these young men and women to go out and serve the world. Right. So right. it's it's an ongoing struggle, and we we have to continue that way. Yeah. Sure. No, ab absolutely. I suppose Lums is really, in a big sense, at least two thirds of the graduates end up staying in Pakistan and build a nation, and then maybe one third leave and build other nation, yeah. other nations in the world. Yeah. Uh, so that can't be a bad thing for a university that's yeah. hardly hardly. Yeah. Only the other thing decades, that yes. uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you are doing from in your school also, but certainly I know the School of Science and Engineering is reaching out to other uh, universities and other schools so that they can, whatever assistance they can give to bring them up in their standard of uh, teaching and learning. And we are bringing students from um, other um, institutions to spend time here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the graduate program, students who have not uh, had the fortune of coming in as undergraduate here, uh, they come in as, some of them are able to come in as graduate students and uh, they are able to provide them the opportunity and put them the polish so that they can go abroad for uh, higher studies. Uh, we have a constant stream of people going from the graduate school, from the from School of Science and Engineering abroad uh, to do their PhD and, uh, and, 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 uh, and MPhils and other uh, higher degrees on full scholarship because uh, most of these, I would say all the people who are coming into the graduate school come from lower middle class family. And that again, I think is a small contribution that we are making to, to um, provide opportunity to young men and women to um, conquer the world. Right, right. Okay, now, now in a sense, you, you, you are viewed, and, and you certainly are, one of the most successful individuals in Pakistan in so many, so many ways. Um, I wonder if, if you look back, how much of that was through your um, sense of direction and efforts, and how much do you think was luck? Well, I mean, I would say, I, I would put it God's grace, luck or whatever it is, and certainly, I was very fortunate that um, I had elders, both my parents and my uh, brothers, um, and my teachers, who um, uh, provided the mentoring and the opportunity. And uh, by, by nature, I've been very inquisitive. Uh, you know, meeting people, asking, learning, and uh, seeing um, what, uh, how one could benefit uh, and learn from them to uh, to emulate some of their examples and uh, and uh, try and um, uh, do uh, you know what little one can do. Right. Uh, on philanthropy, I must tell you a very interesting story. Um, I don't know many people who must have heard of Sir Zafrullah Khan. He was our first foreign minister, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had the opportunity to. Uh, work as his back carrier at the United Nations in 1947. I had just finished my stay at the University of Michigan. So he knew the family and he called me up and he said, if you are free, why don't you come and work for me? So I uh, went to New York and um, I had to pay for my own travel and living and food and everything else anyway. So I was with him and, and he, as you know, belonged to the Amity community. And um, one weekend, he was going to Chicago to open a mosque there. And uh, he said, um, uh, what can you do for my community? And I said, sir, I'm only a student. I, I, uh, I can only spare $100. So he said, give me the $100. <laughs> so I mean, he was not shy to, to ask me for $100 for the Ahmadiyya community, for the, for the mosque he was going to open, because he um, believed in, uh, in, in, in giving money for, for a cause. And I can tell you, I, I knew him quite well. I mean, I spent a lot of time meeting him whenever he came to Lahore. He gave away his personal wealth three times. Whatever, he was not a rich man, but he earned good money as a, as a very successful lawyer. And whatever he had, zero, and then started again. Right. Zero again. Three times during his lifetime, he gave away everything that he earned. Wow. And he died a rich man. 
Right. Because okay. he died about 40 years ago and right. we still talk about him. Right. And I'm hoping that we can have a, a chair in his honor and his name in the law school here. Right. He was um, a man, uh, he, was on the, he was a very successful lawyer. He was a member of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, he became a president of the of the Inter of the United Nations uh, right. Assembly, and then he became a member of the International Court, and he became the Chief Justice of the International Court. There is no Pakistani who wow. ever achieved that kind of a stature, and we wow. need to honor his memory. Right. Right. Well, that's a fabulous story. Yeah, fabulous. yeah. Fabulous. I mean, these are the people that sure. I was very fortunate to yeah. to meet and interact and uh, to learn from. Right. 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 Now, we are, of course, uh, commemorating 75 years of independence and the birth of the nation. Just over 75 years ago, you went to the U.S. and when you came back, uh, you came back to a Pakistan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your recollections of what had changed at yeah, that yeah. time? You know, I saw it from the green side. You know, I, I came back uh, at the end of December 1947. Uh, fortunately, I was not here during the carnage when the massive uh, migration took place. Uh, and when I came to Lahore, I was very sad because most of my friends were non-Muslims. Right. They had all gone away. And um, so one had to uh, build new relationships, new friends. But my, I already graduated from Punjab University in 1945. So my school friends were, were mostly non-Muslim. They had gone away. But I kept in touch with them. and met. But Lahore was uh, totally a... A, a, a different city. It lost its old character. There were a lot of people who had migrated from elsewhere, Muslims who had come here. And um, our family business um, had also um, totally sort of collapsed in the sense it was related to the British Army who went away. So we started from scratch uh, in 1948. But um, it was... Um, uh, it was a good challenge, and there was a tremendous, I mean, Pakistan ha all, had almost nothing at that time by way of industry. We were the granary of India, you know, as you know, and producing cotton and wheat and rice for the rest of India. So the industry was uh, elsewhere in, uh, in India, and uh, so that was an opportunity for us to start uh, new uh, ventures here, and the government was very supportive. They were very keen. And um, of course, that was um, how one um, sort of uh, was introduced into new opportunities and this thing. And then gradually things started settling down. And um, because the government um, was um, small in the sense the bureaucracy was, uh, uh, you know, it had not come to the, the people were, uh, who had migrated from India. They were the sort of the backbone of, uh, of our administration here. Right. Uh, and uh, so decision making was very, very swift. Whatever you wanted to do, you went to government and they said yes or no. Everything was decided on merit, but decision was very quick. Right. And everybody was approachable. I mean, uh, the government of Pakistan had not more than 10 ministers, both for East and West Pakistan. And, and that is why they could decide things uh, in, a, in, a, in a swift manner. Uh, today, if you have a, a government of 70 ministers, how can you decide anything? So, so those were uh, the days that, uh, uh, that is the foundation was laid of the country's development and my uh, belief is that first 20 years of country's development and progress was based on, on the solid work that the bureaucrats and the original uh, government had, had done. Uh, there was, um, you could not point your finger to any minister who was not ethical or any bureaucrat who was not ethical, who, was, uh, who, who did not decide things on merit. 
So this was, um, and, and and that's how the country made progress in the first 25, 30 years. And then, of course, with Ayub Khan's regime coming in, uh, thereafter the rot started. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, one might say that the political landscape then started to change 20, 25 years after after the partition. Um, do you think that it's gone downhill since, or have, has it gone downhill since, or, or have you seen ups and downs? And uh, when you reflect back, where no, do you I think we're going? I think, I mean, today, uh, Pakistan certainly has much more um, talent than there was ever. I mean, we have very educated people, qualified people, not only here, but elsewhere in the world. And um, what, I mean, as it was said earlier on by Mr. Zag Daud and Dr. Sanya Nishta, that the, there is tremendous potential in this country. Uh, all you need is a good government for five years who would look at the country and not at themselves. Right. I have not come across a single politician who talks about Pakistan. They only talk about themselves. Yeah. And you've got to forget about yourself when you are talking about a nation. And not long ago, um, I met a, an economist at Harvard, and he was telling me, he said, you know, all the foreign aid that you get is for two weeks of Pakistan's needs. If you can live on 50 weeks on your own, why can't you live for 52 weeks on your own? Why don't you work hard? and set your house in order. Sure. But we're always looking at handouts. Yeah, that's, a, that's good advice, I, I suppose. Um, now, if we look at Pakistan, and, and I talk to a variety of, of individuals, you know, sometimes outside LUMS, within LUMS, uh, you know, the educated, the less educated, and one key difference is that as you go up the educational ladder, as it were, you find that people have a greater sense of free will and being able to impact an environment. And if you go down, then there's this sense of fatalism that, you know, things are predetermined and they'll be fine. It'll just happen. Do you, th and, and I, I think there was, there was a journalist, um, uh, Walsh, uh, who wrote a book called The Inshallah Nation, referring to this notion that, you know, Pakistanis to a large degree, uh, you know, have a sense of, of, of divine predetermination and therefore your engagement in life can be a little bit less. Do you see that as a problem? Do you see the notion of free will through education as enabling the nation to progress faster? Yeah, I mean, you, you need education, you need opportunity, you need uh, uh, circumstances that enable you to, 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 um, uh, to perform, to implement what you want to do. And uh, so, I mean, you can see uh, in the previous uh, discussion that you had, uh, Dr. Saqib, that you had I mean, here was an individual who started from zero and has now uh, be set up a fantastic organization where he's reaching out to millions of people. It was his, his, uh, his industry, his thought, his integrity, his honesty, his commitment. So things, uh, uh, you know, you, depending on the individual, if you go to the northern areas, you see, go to Gilgit and Skardu, the amount of work that the Khan Foundation has done there with minimal of expenditure. I mean, he got a lot of support. I mean, he put a lot of his own money and he got support from international agencies. But the amount of literacy that they have, not just people are literate, but they are well-educated, they are enthusiastic, they are entrepreneurial. At, at any at one time at LUMS, we have at least 10 to 15 students coming from northern areas. And they all come on merit and they have done extremely well. So, I mean, there are pockets of, of um, demonstration where people have done well because they had the opportunity, they had the facility, they had the support, they, they had the resources. It can be done, it can be multiplied <laughs> in almost every district. All you need is people with honesty, integrity who love what they want to do yeah. and serve people. Sure. I mean, my own feeling is that uh, our parliaments and our assemblies can only 
function well when you ha when a poor man can get, get elected. Right. Um, I had the opportunity to um, to meet uh, Mrs. Thatcher. She came out to Pakistan after she had uh, retired, and I asked her. I said, um, "Ma'am, um, how much did you spend on your election?" She said, "My." Uh, constituency was North Finchley, which is a suburb of London, as you know. And she said, I spent 15 or 16,000 pounds what the party gave me, and that is all I spent. So I said, in our, even in our local municipal election, people spent 160,000 pounds. He said, then you can't have democracy if you spend that kind of money to get elected. So we've got to, <laughs> overall, our whole system of uh, getting people uh, elected to represent people in, in, in the right manner. And, and I tell you, the, the, the common man, the poor man in the village and in the cities, they know who's honest and who's not honest. If they had the, the liberty and the freedom to, to select the right person, they would always select the right person. And people, by and large, <clears throat> have a very honest opinion. I give an example. Kaidiyaz and Mr. Jinnah. This is the time long before partition. <clears throat> he was telling some people, and I was not there, but I, somebody narrated to me that <clears throat> he shared this. He said, whenever I have any problem, an issue which I am sort of wrestling with. I, I have a large meeting, go to the masses and I ask them for the solution and they always give me the right answer. He had the air and he had the, uh, the, the courage to ask people what he should do. Is there any leader today who asks his people? He tells them what he thinks and shoves it down their throat. <laughs> so you need people, I mean, if you see, you see, uh, study Mr. Jinnah's lifetime, he, you know, he came up the ladder. He served at the feet of the great politicians of that time. They were not all Muslims. Gokhale was his, his uh, guru, who was a, uh, who was a Maharashtrian. I asked um, Walpert, who wrote his, um, uh, his biography. I asked him, I said, what, might you write, what make, made you write a biography of Mr. Jinnah? And he said, he had done the biography of Gokhale. And he said, for ten, and he said in Gokhale's biography, he kept on coming up against Mr. Jinnah as a character who was very interesting. And he said, I was waiting for 10 years for somebody to pick up this character and write a book on him. So nobody else came forward, so I wrote a book on him. So, you know, so <coughs> what I said earlier on, yeah. I was very keen to meet people and learn from them. I had a friend who was um, in um, Los Angeles. I went to see him and I, he, he was a bit literati. He was very keen on reading and writing. I said, do you know Mr. Walpert? He said, yes, I met him. So I said, take me to, to Walpert. So I met, he took me to the, to the faculty lounge at UCLA, and I met him there. And uh, so it was a very interesting um, story. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, Mr. Gina has been described by some as the greatest statesman yeah, yeah, who's yeah, ever lived. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he's I tell active. you, it, if it hadn't been Gina, there would have been no Pakistan. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Interestingly, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had said, uh, I think in 1959, she had said that in my lifetime there will never be a woman prime minister. Never? There will never be a woman prime minister. Of course, she became yeah, yeah, yeah. the first prime minister, right? and she stayed a very long time. Yeah. Um, but but maybe one day we'll, we will see a poor man becoming, you know, sort of rising up the ranks yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and leading Pakistan at some stage. Um, that'll yeah, that'll be very interesting. Now, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, scholars often say that. Um, uh, an army can be about different things. An army can protect borders, or it can protect an idea or a cause 
or it can protect itself. Um, do you have any sense of Pakistani army? Um, in which camp would you say it um, it uh, Well, decides? I mean, the, the first um, uh, responsibility of them is to, uh, to make sure that the integrity of Pakistan, I mean, the borders of Pakistan are safe from intrusion from outside. Right. Uh, and, and that is their prime responsibility. And of course, uh, as and when uh, the civil government wants their help to make sure that there is law and order in the country, uh, they should, uh, they, 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 they need to respond because they are servants of the people and they are servants of the civil government. Uh, the army is supposed to be subservient to the civil government, right. not the other way around. Right. So, I mean, I have a lot of respect. Uh, I've, I knew a lot of people in the army because I used to play polo and the, the, many of the senior, um, you know, army uh, officers uh, used to play polo. So I, I knew many of them. And um, so I have a lot of respect for their, for their ability and their integrity and their hard work. But um, their prime duty really is to make sure that the country is, is uh, protected and there's no foreign intrusion there. Sure, sure. Okay, very good. Now, you, um, coming to Lahore, I find myself exposed to a lot of art. Uh, about ten days ago, we, we you know we, I was attending the um, uh, the old Pakistan uh, music concerts, and and uh, recently I visited the Naqsh School of Arts that you founded, and and there's art everywhere. You're a great philanthropist, and you've contributed to the arts in a big way. What role do you think the arts plays in nation building? Well, I mean, uh, art is a part of life, whether it's music, it's design, it is color, it is um, uh, instrumental music, song, anything like that. And uh, as Lahore has been there, it's a living town for the last 2,000 years. So, and it has been, um, uh, you know, it has, uh, it, it has the blend of, uh, you know, all the invaders went through Lahore. So we have blood starting with Alexander's blood right down to the Mughals and then uh, the Marathas came here and everybody else. So they left, everybody left their mark in our population. So it's a, it's a hybrid. Uh, the, the Punjabi is a very hybrid, sturdy uh, individual. And um, it's not only the blood side of it, but it's the knowledge, it's the, the uh, culture, the language, the music, all these things we've inherited and um, they've been kept alive. And um, because um, it was, a, it, was uh, it had been a capital with the Mughals, uh, the Mughal emperor stayed more time in Lahore than in Delhi or in Agra. So they patronized these various um, uh, skills uh, and, and individuals. And um, of course, the Sikhs maintained that also during when they were here. So, and, 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 and the local population of Lahore, which was, um, you know, both Muslim and non-Muslim, they were all patrons of uh, different kinds of cultures and, and arts. So, uh, we've been very fortunate that by, that uh, we that uh, we inherited all these things and they've been kept alive, and we are very lucky that uh, we there is a lot of interest in the younger generations to yeah. to keep these um, arts both uh, uh, both vocal as well as instrumental as well as yeah. arted. We produced some very good artists. Um, you know, starting, uh, well, even before Chukhtai and others, uh, 
uh, and some non-Muslim uh, article uh, artists also lived here, and they are revered, and 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 uh, and also the National College of Art that you may know next to the Lahore Museum, that has played a very important role in reviving these arts and and keeping it alive, right. and and spreading it. Right, right. Okay. Now. <clears throat> You're a great promoter of gender equity. Uh, you've got scholarships here for women, and you want to promote women academics to senior jobs. Uh, um, in a prior conversation, you said to me it wasn't always that way, and you weren't so perceptive of gender inequities. Uh, what changed? Well, I mean, you know, half the world, as the Chinese say, the half the sky is, is supported by the women of this world. Right. So they have to, they have to be respected. They have to be honored, and um, and all, I mean, it's it's in the human nature. I mean, who doesn't like who doesn't love his mother? Right. And if you love your mother, you should have the same respect for other women. They are as important. If somebody is, it must be somebody's sister, somebody's daughter, somebody's mother, and, uh, and as far as they are personal ability is concerned, they are second to none. I mean, I was told yesterday that in some of these engineering and medical colleges now, they have to have a quota for boys to get in because the women are, are, are taking the, 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 you know, most of the spaces which are based on, on, on the marks that they get in the examination. So we need to accept the fact that they are second to none and we need to give them the right place in society in in in, in our uh, uh, and give them the right opportunity to sure. play an important role in in governance and in, in every matter as, as far as the future development of the country is concerned right 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 right, right. Uh, how, how do we bring about that mindset change because uh, not everybody would support that idea what? how do you change people's mind to pursue what you've suggested i think it's changing already i mean you yeah. can see uh, uh, i mean take take this campus you you don't have any any segregation here you don't have any any resentment on uh, we we have a uh, a lady dean of the law school and everybody else, they respect her. She's, um, you know, uh, she has the same authority as any other dean, same respect. Yeah. So it's, it's coming. You have to accept the fact. And of course, at the top also, they have to make sure that women get an opportunity to be a part of whoever's. Uh, we've had. Uh, Prime Minister as, as, as a lady here, and uh, she was very effective, very well respected around the world. Unfortunately, she died prematurely. Sure, sure. Okay, well, um, that's, that's very, very good to hear. Um, I, I want to ask you um, about your achievements. You, you decided with uh, others to I suppose, you know, design and found LUMS when you were in your 60s, and you've accomplished a huge amount, and now you're in your 90s. Um, what other ambitions do you have? Well, I don't know. I mean, today could be my last day, but I, I'm not going to stop thinking of what to do next. Any opportunity I get, anything I think of, any any new idea that I, am, I learn from somebody else, I'd like to do it today rather than tomorrow. And uh, so, but my own attitude towards life is that what little I've done is not enough. Right. One uh, can, should do more and one should keep on, as Ali Khan would say, keep on batting to the last ball. <laughs> right. Right. right, very good. So I, I have one last question for you. And, and this question is, is really to ask you what question do you feel I should have asked you that I haven't? No, I think you, uh, you know, you, people have been sitting here for a long time, so I think, no, you, you've been very, um, you've been very kind. You've not asked me any awkward question. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity and I have so many friends sitting here and I want to thank them for uh, taking the time to 
to, to, to listen to me. I have nothing to add to their knowledge because they're all better equipped than I am, but I'm very wonderful. I'm very happy to, to have them here and to have an opportunity to, to see them and to listen to them. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Well, Barry Lee Said, thank you very, very much. No, I, I've been very fortunate. I can't thank Allah enough for all that has been bestowed on me. And uh, no, so thank you. I hope I can go, on, go out with my boots on. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So this brings us to the close of uh, this summit. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, maybe we can take a question or two if uh, we, yeah. Any questions for Babar Saib? Yeah, burning questions. Yeah, I think there's one there, so we'll take yeah. that question. Hello. Sir, you are an inspiration for all uh, all of us, and thank you for being with us, Babar Sahib. Uh, one thing that you said in your talk is that there is a premium for being honest. And uh, one of your recordings that I have seen is that you also mentioned that there is a price to say no. You in your career resigned many times from federal government. But, uh, but uh, the question is, it's maybe easy for you uh, being belonging to a very strong background to say no and resign from from big post but for a regular corporate professional working hard and making his you know space in in the corporate world it at times very difficult to say no uh, to to no things uh, and you know he has to pay the price but at the same time uh, he 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 thinks otherwise so i i need your input on this sir, and a motivation well i mean it depends on the individual i Last week, I was invited by the administrative staff college to talk to the uh, candidates who were there to be uh, to be trained for to you know go from grade 20 to 21 and 22. And I told them, I said, um, you have to live with your conscience. Um, if you say no, you may. You may upset your minister only once, but uh, your conscience will always be clear. If you say yes to the minister on anything, and then you have to live with that for the rest of your life. So it all depends as to how much you value you give to your own conscience. So I don't think there's any price to be paid for being honest. It's uh, it's, a, it's a way of life. You have to decide whether what what makes you happy inside. You have to live with yourself. Ji. Assalamu alaikum. Ji, my name is Sheikh Umar Said. I'm working for Government of Punjab in their planning department. I have a compliment and a small question. Compliment is like, Babar Sahib, you are a great inspiration. And in line with that, we are trying to do it. And we have also formed a small foundation and helping other with the name of Akuku Libat. And question for you, sir, Professor Sahib, uh, Mr. Al Noor. Like, uh, I understand it's a very good combination where LSE and LAMS are doing such collaboration. So my question to you is what uh, LSE has for uh, Pakistan, people who are sitting here, what uh, opportunities you are there providing, what uh, other support you are giving to Pakistan as an institution, as a learning hub, or what you are uh, being promoting here or what intend to do in future thank you that's a, I, I think that's a lovely question it, the dlsc is about 130 years old it's uh, only about twice the size of lums uh, it it has experts in a variety of areas it is primarily a social science school political sciences economic sciences and and there are pockets of individuals who are interested in aspects of research relating to pakistan and so the south asia center brings all that research together and collectively we're looking at issues in terms of their deeper complexities and interrelationships and a sorts of thinking that might underpin the actions that, say, policymakers and decision makers can take. So 
this is this is happening at one level. I think at, at a different level, what the LSE attempts to do is to bring to light conversations that are perhaps taking place in different regions of the world which have global significance. And what happens in South Asia, what happens in Pakistan, I think is of relevance and is of value to the rest of the world. So uh, the LSE is really um, a sort of a, a platform that enables conversations to take place that are instructive to others, that enable comparative analysis, that essentially allow us to think about tomorrow in the context of what we know today. The LSE's motto is to understand the causes of things. I think LUMS is not actually that distant. Most academics seek to do that. But I think what we try and do is to bring together a variety of ideas that relates to South Asia and what South Asia can contribute to the rest of the world, including, of course, Pakistan. Um, aside from that, of course, we, we have scholarships and we have fellowships. Uh, we, we, in fact, we are taking um, a, a research fellow from the Gurmani School next year to spend six months with us. And that sort of engagement, I think, builds on relationships. And actually, it speaks to what Barbara Lee is always saying, learning from others. And LSE can learn from Pakistan in a very big way. So a wide variety of, um, I, I suppose, routes that we take in order to elevate conversations that relate to this part of the world uh, and, and relate them to others who can benefit from them. So, so uh, you know, a lot of conversations, a lot of discussions. But ultimately, I think these are the basis on which action gets built, on which change takes place. And, and this is really what both LUMS and LSE are about, which is why this collaboration, I think, is extremely fruitful. Uh, but th thanks for that question. Thank you. So from, so we'll one take question one from my more. side, sir. One more. Um, and, yeah. Actually, sir, we have been discussing the social problems Pakistan has been facing and how we can move forward in, 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 in the years to come. Uh, one phenomena which I have uh, observed that uh, the, uh, the kids or the young children from uh, the smaller cities who come to Lahore, Islamabad, they don't go back to the cities after getting uh, the education completed from here. So that is a problem, brain drain, you can say, from the small cities to Lahore. And also it, uh, it burdens the big cities like Lahore, because I have been in Lahore and uh, 20 years back, it is not the same city which I have been living in 20 years back. So uh, I think the role models like you, I, maybe LAMS should have the campuses in smaller cities as well. Or uh, you do have any plan like that no, 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 no. in Faisalabad, for example? No, no, we, we you know, we, we it, it's a, it's an uphill task even to play, keep this place alive, <laughs> you know. So we, you know, you can't have Cambridge or Oxford in two in another no, places. I agree. So I agree. So we, we, our our effort is really to keep on improving uh, and making Ilams a better place so that uh, we can then help other universities elsewhere okay. to come up to our level that or learn something from them. I think we should. Uh, thank, thank, you. Call it today. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me then, then close the conference. I'd like to thank, of course, all the speakers this morning, this afternoon, and Babar Saib. Uh, the audience has been spectacular, asking solid questions and, and, and intensively listening. Um, so it's really been an eye opener, I think. We have had a huge amount of interaction and help from our alumni here, and also from the LSE alumni. Uh, so that collaboration is also taking place at a deeper level. Uh, at LUMS, a very wide number of uh, uh, people have engage in making this uh, summit possible. Uh, just to highlight a few, we have uh, Aisha Fatima, Omar, Tabinda, Muhammad Ali, Aisha Khan, Shafkat, Muslim, Sherbano, all of them. But I think there are very many silent workers behind the scenes who've helped in so many ways. So we'd like to thank them all. Um, a big thank you to them. Um, I know this has been in the planning for, in fact, many months, and some people were up the whole thank night. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a recording of uh, today's events will be available on LSE's website and on social media in the next two weeks. Uh, of course, the uh, South Asia Center has social media and do hook on for future um, um, uh, activities that we, we undertake. Uh, we hope to be back every year, but we certainly will be back at the 80th anniversary. 
So hopefully we'll see you then. Uh, bid you farewell and uh, take care and good afternoon. Thank you.